I don't want to tell that story. Stop reminding me. Stop reminding me of when I moved, the mover stole my diary. <laughs> All right, here's what happened. <laughs> Once upon a time, <laughs> before I became so jaded in the world, when I was back in college, and you know when you're in college, you're really by yourself, even though you have friends, but you're really on your own path, and you're trying to figure out who you are, and what better place to express yourself than to write it down in a diary? Because you look at that, and you say, one day I'm going to be somebody, and I'm going to look back on these years, I'm going to be like, Wendy, girl, you were a mess. <laughs> So, so I had a diary, right? And I kept it all through college, and, um, and it was thick. It was, you know, a, a loose leaf thing. It was a binder. Um, so I, I kept it all through college, and I would do an entry every day. And then when I left for my first radio job, I would do an entry every day. I was in St. Croix. I was by myself. I was on the radio. And then my second radio job was in Washington, D.C. Well, when I landed my big job from D.C., I landed, you know, my big job here in New York, I moved. So, you know, they gave me moving expenses and everything like that. So I was able to have a, you know, a moving company come, and I packed up my own stuff, because I don't trust anybody, and I had a piece of luggage that I put, like, a bunch of, like, like Fendi bags and Gucci bags and stuff in, you know, and, but this is the one that I was going to drive in with my Subaru that my parents had given me for college graduation. So the movers were behind me. We were driving to North Jersey so that I could move into my place, and I don't know what happened to this piece of luggage. Somebody stole it. Was not, it was a piece of Fendi luggage. My parents had gotten it for me in Italy. It was before roller luggage, so it was shaped like a square. And st I get sick just telling this story. So they stole the luggage, and inside they found a bunch of designer bags and the coveted diary. The good thing is that was so long ago, if they actually had it, those stories would have been published. Now I got a TV show. I bet you're sorry, aren't you? <laughs> Can we talk? I was on bed rest the whole nine months. I wasn't thinking about covering sockets or moving the 409 up to a higher cabinet. <laughs> I was just so happy to have a baby. I forgot about all, I forgot about all the preventative stuff. Do you know what I mean? I forgot. I mean, thank goodness he didn't take a bobby pin and stick it in there. Do you ever, had, have you ever done that experiment? Oh, no. <laughs> well, I, I have. That might be part of my problem. You know, you do a lot of stupid things when you're kids. You know, my brother's only three years younger than me. So, you know, the two of us, you know, bobby pins, you know, you pop the rubber tip off of it and you walk over to the socket. I was like 10. You know, just put it in there. You feel a little, and then you're like. <laughs> Ooh. I'm gonna need some camera assistance for the following, and don't judge me. I was born with a sixth finger on my left hand. Excuse me. Before I show you, Rambo, that I wish that my parents kept on because my how you doings would be really fantastic, right? All right, yeah. And here it is. Here it is. All right. Do you see it? Do you, do you see it? Do you see the bump? Do you want me to profile? And get, look, there's a little profile. Yes. It, would, it gives a whole new meaning to clip my nails. How you doing? When I was a little girl, I went to Oakhurst Country Day Camp. And that's in Oakhurst, or New Jersey. And, uh, you know, it was a full-service camp. They had the horseback riding and all the good stuff, bowling on rainy days and good vending machines. I loved the scooter pies. <laughs> Back then, they were only 35 cents. And so we went, and my, um, my um, uh, counselor did not put the harness on tight enough. I'm on the horse now, a chubby first grader, a little spastic, still am. <laughs> I get on there and I hold on to this nub. Now, you know that nub? Like, why do they only put a nub on, on the seat? I'm holding on to the nub. It wasn't tight enough, the, the saddle. The saddle swings underneath the horse in slow motion. Well, I can barely do a pull-up, much less hold myself. I ended up staying there for one second under the horse. I ended up dropping to the ground, banging my head. The horse stepped on my arm. And I will never return to a horse again. That's it. I can't. I wet the bed until I was 12. Did I ever tell you that? It's okay, I'm fine now. 
Everybody's got issues, but yeah, I wet the bed until I was 12. And so, you know, 12, that's virtually like fully formed, you know? <laughs> like you're virtually having your period and, and still doing something child, like, like wetting the bed. And I remember what I used to do is I used to flip my own mattress <laughs> so my parents wouldn't know. And I would take the sheets and I would hide them and then wash them when my, it's okay, <laughs> okay? Uh, and then hide them in the closet until I got home from school. I was a latchkey kid. You know, you pull that key out and you open the door and then I'd wash my sheets myself and stuff. But yeah, and I don't know what kind of problem that is, but they, they always say there's something psychological, like maybe my parents called me fat or something. No more. Yeah. Until I was 12. Yep, there's definitely a problem. I do believe in parents giving tough love. When I was younger, my father, Daddy, I know you're watching. <laughs> my father used to always tell me, Wendy, you're so pretty, but you're fat if you would just lose some weight. Aww. Now it hurt my feelings, but I got a talk show now. <laughs> Personally speaking, the way I like to deal with Kevin is I don't attack his dreams directly. I go around the dream, <laughs> you see. Um, like, for instance, he always wanted to be an NBA basketball player. He's obsessed with basketball. That's what he wanted to do. Um, I don't want him to be an NBA basketball player because I feel like on account of my skin, is that all we do is entertain and play sports? <laughs> Including me being, is that all we do? Like, like I want him to, to be a scientist or, or, or something. I, I want him to be a boss, not an entertainer. And um, so, you know, me and his father, we have this way of tag teaming and talking around it. Like, you don't want to be an NBA player, you know. Sometimes they're less than smart, sometimes. Sometimes you have a shelf life in your career. Sometimes you have to deal with the superficiality of the world saying, mm hmm, another black basketball player. And so, anyway, so we talked around it, and he no longer wants to be an NBA player. As a matter of fact, yeah, yeah, please. And he, and he thinks that he figured it out for himself when in reality, me and my husband used the Jedi mind trick on him. I was so disgusted. <laughs> with the whole weight gain and, you know, the miscarriages before having little Kev. Just the whole, I had to be on bed rest for nine months. And the only thing that distracted me was the radio station reluctantly put all the equipment in the house. So I was on the radio every morning just to take my, yeah, yeah, I'd lay there on the couch. He's baking. I'm, <laughs> I'm ha yeah, yeah, I'd lay, you know, on the couch every morning. Um, but, you know, the name thing wasn't a big deal to me. I promise you this. I knew at the clearing of the EPT, when it said positive, <laughs> I knew that the baby's name would be Kevin. Girl or boy, I don't care. <laughs> Look, I am busy. I had two five-month miscarriages. Those girls were named Kevin also. <laughs> so by the time I hit the crossroads, I'm gonna have, what, three Kevins going? Like, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. <laughs> Here's the thing, that's my husband's name, and I wasn't that persnickety about like names and stuff like that. When Ke little Kevin popped out, I'm like, <laughs> now what? <laughs> yeah, mommy, daddy, can you please stay? And my parents uh, lived with us for three months, which was the best thing ever because prior to young Kevin, I'd only held two babies before, my niece and my nephew, and I held them with nervousness. Like, I wouldn't babysit him or nothing. Not when they're like this. Don't leave. I don't know what to do. You know, hold him, and I need a spotter. Somebody to spot me underneath. You know? Um, but I had never really spent time with babies before. I didn't even really care about babies before until we got in the... Is that wrong to say? until we got in the baby making business. Then all of a sudden, you know, when we had the miscarriages and I'm like, oh my gosh. And so, you know, I was like, no, we're gonna have a baby. It's all gone it. And so then we ended up having Kev and I pushed him out. I didn't have a c uh, you know, I pushed him out. And, um, and my mother and my husband were in the room. And I had on full makeup and a wiglet. <laughs> full makeup and an updo falsy. You know what I mean? Nails done. You know, everything fleek. <laughs> you know, when he was a goober, we'd take him like to the ice shows and you know, the circus and you know, the, the, the Shrek movies and all that. Can I be perfectly honest with you? Yeah. I do not miss those years. <laughs> like, 
We would go to places to see like Thomas the Tank Engine. There's this place in Jersey, like that, that with those balls in there. And you, I mean, I would sit like I was interested, but can I just tell you, 14 is challenging, but I'll take 14 over four any day. <laughs> And we used to go to the movies, you know, to the, to the kiddie movies and stuff. And I literally would always, this is horrible, but he's in school, don't tell him. Look, I would always have him sitting on this side of me because I part my hair when I wear a side part. I make a deep side part over here, pull that hair over 30 seconds into the movie as long as I'm holding his hand, you know. Look. <laughs> and he would be none the wiser. And if I could take him to like one of those kitty things, you know, in the Saturday afternoon at the big arenas and stuff and leave after 30 minutes and strap him in his chair, I would have done that too. I can't believe they have an upstep for you, mommy. <laughs> like you're that short that they have to, they have an upstep and they glitterized it. My mom, my mom is only like five feet two. And so, yeah, I know, oh. But she would know how to reach up and get me when she needed to. <laughs> <laughs> I make it no secret that my mother loves being the mother, both my parents, they love being the parents of the talk show host. They pride themselves in leaving their house, always looking their best. They, they pride themselves, I told you, when they get on the airplane, they pay on the... <laughs> well, they, they pace up and down the aisles when 10 a.m. Eastern time hits to see, to, no, no, look, to see whose TV is on the Wendy show. <laughs> get the extra blue chips. People will be like, Mr. and, Mr. and Mrs. Williams, oh, well, here's some extra blue chips. For you. <laughs> anyway, so they suck, they suck it up and it's kind of cute, you know, because my parents are like older and they don't mean to hurt anybody. So, you know, but when my mother and father, particularly that mother of mine, if they're ever papped, she drinks it in. I have an example. Here it is. Here we are, right? <laughs> <laughs> we had gone to Fred's, see, we had leftovers. We had gone to Fred's at Barney's because they make delicious chicken livers. And, you know, so we went in there. We didn't shop in the store. We just went to the restaurant, you know? And as soon as we came out, you know, I, I heard people call a name. And I'm laughing because I just delight in my parents' ridiculousness, I guess. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still just, I delight in having them around uh, most of the time. Um, <laughs> And, and so my father, I guess he's looking out for the car and trying to play cool. But look at my mother. She's posing <laughs> and lifting a leg. She's ready to go. <laughs> Apparently, they were playing uh, truth or dare, and they dared each other to lick donuts on the counter. <laughs> now look, everyone. These aren't the donuts that I bought, because I'm not a donut person. I haven't had a donut in 100. Although, when we were on tour about three years ago, um, with the bus and we drove across the country, you know, promoting the show. It was a big pink bus. Oh, it was beautiful. It slept 12 people. Anyway, um, the light went on at the Krispy Kreme. <laughs> and so my husband and son, they, they are magnets to the light. And I was like, no, I'm staying in the bus. And I was in there, you know, with the glam squad. We had a whole crew of people that we were traveling with listening to music and they come back in the bus and they make me they push the donut in my face. <gasps> it was good though. But that was the last time I had a donut. Well, let me tell you something. When I was a kid growing up, and nobody in my family knows this, but they all watched the show. So attention, my Williams family, not the Hunters. I wasn't a Hunter back then, I was a Williams. Attention, mommy, daddy, Wanda, Tommy. About the peanuts. <laughs> I didn't start to like peanuts until I'm a grown woman now. I had walnuts for breakfast. But I used to unscrew the top off the peanuts, put a whole bunch in my mouth, lick the salt off, and spit them back in the jar. We've all had nasty ways, that's all I'm saying. There's another thing about Monique that um, people have talked about since forever, and that is that she's not such a nice person behind the scenes. 
Daniel himself talked about, like, during the butler, how she was basically not such a nice person behind the scenes. And I had heard that about you for years, Monique. I don't know you behind the scenes. I just know you when we had our, we were working on that talk show for Disney, remember? It was called Girlfriend, starring me and Monique. <laughs> Once upon a time, back in 1993. No, really, I thought we were we were about to do it. <laughs> I was on the radio. Monique was telling jokes in Baltimore. That's where she's from. So I knew Monique before she went Hollywood, and maybe she went Hollywood and then she got the attitude. I don't know. Sometimes Hollywood changes people. But years ago, there was a show called Something or Another, and Kamora Simmons was on it. What was it called? Life and Style. Life and Life and style. Yeah. yeah. This is back when I was in radio. This is like maybe 10 years ago, and. I, more than that, even. Well, gee. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I had a road to hustle before finally getting a talk show. But, but here's what happened. Um, there was this show, and Kamora was on it, and S Selena Garrett or something or another. Garrett. Uh -huh. And Jules Asner, she who's married right. to Steven Soderbergh. Remember, he, she used to be on the E! Channel. And it was, it was like, you know, four or five girls. And I got called in, you know, to the main office to... Um, you know, interview to be on the panel. They really liked me. You know, my radio career was already popping. They were gonna be taping it here in New York. And I was like, wow, talk show. <laughs> but when I got there and, you know, I liked the other girls, no disrespect to them, but I was the only one who had broadcast experience. So, you know, here goes me, cause you know, I'm very opinionated. I'm like, okay, this all sounds wonderful, you know, but am I the Barbara Walters? <laughs> like, let, 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 let's just get it started. Every, every panel show's got to have a leader. And I was the only one who was already in media. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I wanted to, I wanted to be the... They said no, and it was really, really hard for me to do, but I stuck to my guns and said, no, then I can't be part of this show. And so they ended up, they said, no, Jules Asner is the, um, the Barbara Walters. And I was like, what? I mean, no disrespect, Jules, but I'm just saying, you know, I have more broadcast experience than you, and I just felt as though I should have been the bar. Anyway, the show ended up getting canceled and whatnot. I gave two weeks notice only one time in my life, and guess what I got out of it? Go now. You're fired. I'm like, what? Okay, I'm not going to call the parties out. But I will tell you this, I was, it was Radio Wendy, and I had landed this fantastic job here in New York. And I gave two weeks notice, like I was all, I was 21 years old, so I was bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. I'm like, guess what? I landed a job at, you know, this new radio station. I'm, I'm gonna be big. Oh, maybe, thank you so much for helping me along the way. Oh. And she was like, <laughs> and the job that I got was a huge pay increase and just huge status and whatnot. But I, ironically, I cried like a baby when, when she said, get out, because I'm just like, oh my gosh. A hater. <laughs> a hater. Back when I was on the radio here in New York, I was working at a station called 98.7 KISS. <laughs> And I used to do the shift that was from 6 at night to 10 at night, which means nobody's around working, right? And a lot of my coworkers would get that direct deposit thing. But you know how they put the stub in your mailbox? Well, back then, there was no seal on the mailboxes. And it's late at night. And I, and I have on, like, a 12-minute Colonel Abrams song. I'm not gonna let. Right? <laughs> so, what do you think I do? I'm at the station by myself. The intern's watching the board. Colonel Abrams is singing. And I'm wondering how it is that I'm at the top of the pop as far as New York DJs. What is everyone else making? <laughs> I went to everyone's mailbox. <laughs> Because I was the youngest, but I was also the most popular. And the, my negotiation was about to come up. And so I just took everyone's stub, <laughs> unsealed them with a, with a steamer, <laughs> to see, and then sealed them back. And guess what? My negotiation worked out well. <laughs> but if I didn't know, it wouldn't have gone that way. That's all. Well, I have a little story for you. Ooh. 
No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, not me. Not me. <laughs> but I can tell you, once upon a time, I worked at a radio station here in New York called 98.7 KISS. And I used to work with the morning show, and I did this segment um, called Dishing the Dirt, which is like hot topics. <laughs> See, I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> but back then, it was like 1990. There was no internet, no, you know, so, you know, you get your information from what you see when you're out in the club or by reading the magazines. I was perusing the Inquirer magazine, and I came across an interview that they did with Dr. Cosby. Now, ironically, this is one of the only times he's ever spoken out about these sexual allegations, and it was to the Inquirer <laughs> back then. So I dust the article off, and I talk about it in my Dish the Dirt segment, you know, with the Wake Up Club. I was part of a, you know, a club. Next thing you know, Cosby rings up the general manager, demands for me to be fired. Uh-huh. Um, talk to the general manager in such a way that the general manager, my own boss, turned on me like a wild pit bull. Oh. Called me in, in his office in the middle of the you know, morning broadcast. Cosby's on the speakerphone. Cosby dressed me down and called me everything but a daughter of God. Oh. Now, that's my own personal account with these allegations. And this, is like I said, was back in 1990. If, if somebody's turning on you, don't retreat. Don't get weak. You know, you are the strongest person that you know. I remember when I first started um, a job in Philly, um, when I was left dead on the turnpike from New York, and I, and I, and I worked in Philly, and um, I just had a seven-week miscarriage, uh, like the same week I was there. And uh, then I started my job. At the end of the work week, my boss, a woman, um, not that that matters, but I'm just you know, describing, my boss called me into her office my program director at that time, okay? Now, I'm brand new to Philly. I just had the miscarriage. You know, uh, you know I was left for, for dead from New York. And, and I had to start a new life. So she goes, close the door. So I closed the door, right? <laughs> and I sat down. I was like, yes? You know, best behavior, first week there. You know, you don't show out until you've earned your bones. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was like, yes? <laughs> so she goes to me. Wendy, you know, I want things to really work for you here in Philly. You know, this is a city that could really embrace and love you. But I don't want you to become a dinosaur in your radio style. She said, what you did in New York, you know, this is a different kind of city. We're more family-oriented and, you know, so on and so forth. She said, I don't want you to become a dinosaur and I want you to do well here. Well, you know I'm a crier, okay? <laughs> so my eyes start to sting, like something's about to happen. And I was only there for a week. And then I got misty. And then the meeting was over. And I closed the door. I blink, blink, blink. Oh, my gosh, I still get upset thinking about this. Oh my gosh, it's okay, I won. But no, no. I still get... Uh, I still get misty thinking about this because this was one of those times where I didn't need to hear that. And um, I ran outside to my SUV and I, I put the, the sun sh shield up <laughs> for privacy and I called my father and just vented. And... I still kept my same dinosaur style, which is the same thing I do right here. Sorry. Sorry. No, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. That was just, that was a really pivotal time in my life because if I changed my style, I would be corny and not authentic to myself, and then you all wouldn't be watching. <laughs> By the way, I've run into her a few times. <laughs> no, listen, no, listen. And, and every time I see her, I'm like, hello, it's me, the dinosaur. <laughs>
I, I have this girlfriend, you know how I'm always telling you, if you're single and you want to meet men, you go where the men are, whether it's the boat show, the car show, or like when they have their fraternity conventions, you go to the fraternity conventions and you go with maybe one girlfriend or no girlfriends and you perch yourself in the lobby and you have a lot of thigh out and, and you have your wits about you and you wait to meet, meet your mister, right? Well, I have a girlfriend who... <laughs> I have this girlfriend who um, did just that. She went by herself to a fraternity um, convention. I think it might have been the Q's. You know, they wear the gold and the um, purple. She's perched in the lobby, hair laid, you know, <laughs> a career on point, shoes good, you know, legs showing. She's kikiing and you know, being entertained, all the men. Next thing you know, her front tooth popped out of her skull. <laughs> into the glass or in her lap. The tooth fell down on the floor. Well, now, I don't have any fake teeth yet, but when I need them, I'll get them. They tell me fake teeth are expensive, so you don't just leave it there. She had to get off the bar stool and get down on the floor on all fours, crawling around looking for the tooth. She slinked back to her house. She never got any phone numbers. And can you, just all of you all with the, with the teeth, good luck. I've never been to a prom. But don't, don't feel sorry for me, I got a talk show. <laughs> is there anyone in our audience by Clapation that has never been to a prom? I said clap. <laughs> no, no, you know what? Prom season's coming up. This is probably about the time of the year that kids think about who they're gonna go to the prom with. May's right around the corner. If you are not prom material or you're not going to your prom, Please don't feel bad. You know, keep your eye on the prize. And the prize is the, the reunion when you go back and show them, show them what you made of. Here's the way I played my love life when I was a younger girl, 19 and 21 years old. My parents had four years of college tuition, and that's it. I had no dowry. Daddy couldn't give me a job. Mommy's a school teacher. What's she gonna give me? I knew that I had to get out here and, and make my bones, and I did not have time to be deeply in love, going away to college, following some boyfriend from high school, and then staying in Boston after I graduated because I was in love. Like, I, like, honestly, my senior year, I did have a boyfriend. You know what I'm saying? And we weren't on the outs or anything like that, but I knew by the second half of my senior year that this is just a little something to occupy my time. I didn't tell him that. <laughs> And I loved him and everything, but love to me is like a light switch. In love is deep. Love is like, all right, on, off. I, got, I have things to do. <laughs> and, and literally, and literally, um, after graduation, I told him, okay, we've got to end this relationship because I'm only going to be making $3.75 an hour. <laughs> that, was, that was minimum wage back in the day. Working a four-hour shift on the radio five days a week. You do the math. Oh. I wasn't poor. I was poor. <laughs> And so I told this guy, I'm like, look, I need to break up with you in the name of I got things to do. I got to work on my career because daddy doesn't have money for me. And what am I going to do with this degree? And so I broke up like, and I'm not a cruel, evil person. I just don't understand love this deep. I, I, I just, not that, not that young, not that young. I think the dumbest thing I did for a guy when I was 17 was I bought him a polo shirt. <laughs> shirt. It was purple with a polo pony and I bought it from Hanes. Oh. Remember Hanes? <laughs> and I gave it to the guy. We weren't even dating, but this is me being dumb, trying to woo somebody with a polo shirt. <laughs> That's okay. I bet you he, I bet you he wish he took it and stayed with me now. <laughs> I dated a guy whose mom looked down on me. This was many years ago. I was like maybe 22 years old. <gasps> You know, um, he had a very, very nice career. And, and, you know, I was like this lowly DJ lady. You remember back in the day when there was 98.7 Kiss and I did the, I used to do the traffic and dish the dirt in the morning. That was back in maybe 2000 or 1990, uh, 1989 or something like that, you know? So I was just getting my career going on. The hours were rough, you know? Um, that was back when girls wore Timberlands with a baseball hat and, and the pony hair. You know, Mary J. Blige, real love. What's the 411 hun look? You know what I'm talking about. We all dressed like that. You know, the Carhartt jackets and, 
you know? And this guy's career was a little bit different than mine, so I was able to be, you know, chillaxed in, it, for the most part and run back and forth to the city all hours of the night because I was, it was a grind. You know, when you're in, in your beginning years of your career, you don't choose your hours. You go when the hours are chosen for you and you grind. That's what you do. But the mom looked down on me. He was black, but not black. They were like, block. <laughs> your laughter makes me think that you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, there's black people, and then there's block people. <laughs> well, they, they were real block. <laughs> and she, they, look, they looked down on me like, you know, my career was a nothing. They probably aren't saying that now. Yeah. But I, I knew from that point, with the mom not really liking me, and then he was an only child, which made it even worse, you know, the only one to concentrate on, I just knew that it wouldn't be anything more than a few great dates off his expense account, and, and then I'd be moving on. I could not date somebody whose mom didn't at least tolerate me. You, you know, she doesn't have to love me, but at least tolerate me and be a good enough actress not to let me know that you don't like me. Many, 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 many years ago, I worked at this radio station in Washington, D.C., W.O.L., and for about two weeks, I dated a guy named Wendy. <laughs> yes! Yes! The name was awkward, but he was big. He was built like a bear. And then ironically, like three days ago, I'm coming out of a building from a meeting here in Manhattan, and there was a delivery guy outside. And he comes running up. He goes, Wendy, my name is Wendy too. <laughs> and he had the name tag on, Suzanne. He wasn't lying. <laughs> Many years ago, me and my son were out at the mall, and we ran into an old boyfriend of mine. Oh. Not ooh, I know exactly, uh, please, I knew exactly how to play it. First of all, he's moved on and gotten married, lives someplace in Jersey. I was with my son, you know, startled to see this guy. The first thing I did was held my stomach in. You know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why that is. You know, you know. <laughs> but I ran into him and it was just like, hi, hello, and, and see you later. There was no stopping and talking and whatnot, you know? But, um, I, and I knew my lip gloss was popping because we had just, <laughs> wait, look, look. Because me and my son had just finished eating. So you know, after you eat, you clean your teeth and then you put your lip gloss back on. So I knew everything was correct. Cocaine is the devil. And um, I've shared with you many times that I must rip my life apart many, many years ago. I used to smuggle it on the plane and every place else also. But I, yes, I was the worst too. But now I'm not and I got a talk show and I'm sober. For, for about 10 years, I was really caught up in a bad way. You can hide a little glassine bag of cocaine any place. It's easy to hide. It's the behavior that you exhibit after you're high. You know, the sweating. <laughs> the jaw winding, <laughs> the constant trips to the peephole because you're paranoid. I mean, when I was done, I was done, even with the people, the lifestyle, everything. I just, um, but, but good luck staying sober. And a shout out and acknowledgement to anybody else, you know, fighting addiction. It is a mother, but uh, keep up the good fight. <laughs> I went to the Playboy Mansion once. This was many, many years ago. I had this little show called Wendy Williams is on Fire on VH1. So, oh, and so, the, you know, the TV cameras were in the studio when I was doing my radio show. If you look on YouTube, it's probably there. But then we'd also take the cameras and we'd go on like excursions. So one of the excursions was to go to the Playboy Mansion. Well, it was popping that night, you know. <laughs> everybody was scantily clad. Hef was walking around in that robe. And, um, and, but I could not bring myself like to eat the past hors d'oeuvres because all I'm thinking about are like the jerk, like all the. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like all the spunk. <laughs> and, and, and so, and then we went to the grotto, but I didn't get in. I just wanted to see it. And it was all steamy and slippery back there. <laughs> Well, then we got thrown out. <laughs> Quick story, then I'm gonna get back to Leonardo and, uh, and Rihanna. So, you know, I'm being Wendy in there. Like, like I'm talking to you right now, like, ew, it's dirty. 
It's dirty. And I think I made a comment about one of Hef's lead girls, but I was talking to my husband. But you know, I talk loud, <laughs> especially after a few drinks. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I said something about the girl. And then I said, and where's Hef with that musty robe? <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't need it. Sometimes men of a particular age have a little must to them. Well, I was overheard by security, who were equally, his security is equally as old as him. Like, I don't think they could fight on account of arthritis, and they definitely can't run, but they might be like sharpshooters or something, I don't know. Anyway, they kicked me, my husband, the camera crew out upon hearing my big loud mouth. And we, and no, so we, <laughs> we literally were sitting on the curb waiting for the car to loop around to come get us. When I went to the bathroom at the Playboy Mansion, I was, <laughs> I was going to keep, you know, one of the tchotchkes, you know, all that crap that people sit on the sink and, you know, in their house and stuff. But I was just nervous because I said, well, maybe there's a camera here or something like that, you know. I backed into a car in West Orange, New Jersey, in a strip mall. Oh. <laughs> about two, about a year and a half ago. Oh. I didn't tell anybody, cause I, I didn't know I did it, the music was banging. <laughs> Look, no. Cause like, you know that little bass knob right here that you can get put in your car? It kicks the bass. So this was not old Aunt Wendy, this was young Wendy, okay? <laughs> and I'm, and the music is banging, I'm backing into the space. I didn't realize I hit a car. Uh -oh. At the same time the music is banging, the phone rang and it was my son, and so I had to get home. So I still had the bass banging and I pulled out. I didn't recognize anything. <laughs> well, honey, about an hour later, zing zong. <laughs> Two squad cars. <laughs> we don't even live in West Orange. They came all the way, apparently some big mouth squawker in the strip mall, copied down my plate, <laughs> and gave it to the cops. The cops show up at the house. So, and they're like, well, where's your truck? So I, I'm like, so I go around to the garage. Now it's like I'm hiding it. And so immediately, what do we do when we feel like we um, are wrong, girls? Cry, Cry! yes! My bank, my bumper is done. Not, not done, but just, you know, a little something, something. Um, but I didn't feel it because the bass was banging. The bumper was done. I'm crying. The cops were nice. They said, how you do? I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm like, all right, officers, really, how am I gonna tell my husband? Because I go into total girl mode, you know. <laughs> Even though me and Kev are on equal, we're partners. But when you can play that girl card, you play it, girl, right? Look, I'm like, please know how you doing. I'm doing the worst. I've got on no wig. I've got on my robe. I've done this. I've got to tell my husband. I had no idea. Anyway, I go to court. But we hired an attorney to go to court just for, and I got off, because I didn't know what I did. <gasps> you know, I played, you know, batty woman, because I guess I was, at that particular time, batty woman slash hood chick with the bass knob. <laughs> um, if you're new, uh, look, I have this ex-husband. <laughs> I once was married to a guy. And I'm not saying names. <laughs> I wore that big stupid dress. Those stupid bridesmaids, for which I know none of them now. <laughs> well, that happens. You know how weddings go. Yeah. I was so not into it that I had my mother plan the whole thing. Like, yeah, whatever. She set up all the appointments. She picked the place that it should be. It was at a nice yacht club in Rumson in New Jersey. It was at, uh, she picked out the bridal shop. We went and tried on dresses. She picked out the one she liked best on me. Like, I was checked out, but I was already too involved. And then, you know how people start sending you your wedding gifts before the actual wedding? And as the gifts were coming in, like, I don't break out in hives, but I felt like I was breaking out in hives. 
and I wouldn't open the gifts, and then my mom opened the gifts. You know how your mom opens the gifts and she sets them all up on the dining room table and on the buffet? so that you can take a look at them. And you know, and I didn't get the thank you notes. My mom got the thank you notes. And walking down the aisle, I knew it was the wrong thing to do. And yes, I cried, but I was only crying because I knew I was about to make the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> it was horrible. The only good thing about the day is that I did, I did have a hand in what we were gonna eat. <laughs> and we had everything. We had lobster and crab and firm shrimp like this. <laughs> and definitely an open bar to get me through the day. <laughs> And he, he wasn't about the fat thing. It wasn't even the weight. But he used to, like, uh, this is before I wore um, weave, a wig. I went through a period where I, you know, put a little hair weave on my thin struggle hair and, and make it to be something big. He wouldn't like the hair weave. He like just my natural hair. He wouldn't want me to wear makeup. God forbid I put on something remotely sexy, you know? Oh, well, please, it lasted for five months. <laughs> And I hope you're watching now. Look what you missed out on, stupid. Yeah. And he and I were coworkers at um, the radio station. And, but I was the DJ and my ratings were huge. So his job wasn't as important to the radio station as my job was, okay? I worked from six to 10 at night. So I wasn't there during the day. And I didn't see a lot of coworkers and stuff. And I pressed my own buttons. I'm in the room by myself with an intern. It wasn't like a big operation. Um, and he was here in New York. And he was bad mouthing me to all the coworkers saying horrible things. And I got called in to the general manager's office with other big wigs, you know, that were in there. They let me know he is crapping all over your reputation. What do you want us to do? No, 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 no. Yeah, in other words, fire him. I said, nope, let him breathe. Yeah, that's the kind of woman I am. And I never had to say anything bad about him because he was doing it to himself by talking about me. Okay? And now I'm on TV. And then... After only being, all right, we were engaged for a year. You know, you take that year to plan the wedding. We dated for about a year before. Sometimes when you know, you know. And then, to make matters worse, a five-month marriage, it took this... <laughs> mother father. <laughs> it took us a year and change to get a divorce because he wanted money. Aww. Really, girl? Aww. I know. Aww. Well, some men are suckers. Yeah. Sucker. By the way, he never got money. He didn't even show up at divorce court. The judge was laughing at him. My lawyer was laughing at him. And I, I just, ugh, ugh. <laughs> Who's sorry now? Yeah. I mean, it happens. And if I could tell younger people, don't do it, but you wanna know what? It's really difficult. You're standing there in that white dress, you know, when a bride has her moment by herself and she looks in the mirror and she's fixing herself. And you know, I don't like a wedding, so I had paid for the wedding, but I gave my mom an open checkbook. <laughs> I, sh I should have known then that, you know, getting married was wrong, but it wasn't really about the wedding. It was about the champagne lined up in the reception room. We had it at the yacht club. We had the honeymoon plan and I just had to go through it. We went away on the honeymoon. It wasn't like a honeymoon. It was like, oh hell, I guess I should. <laughs> Literally, I'm plotting the whole time, how long do I have to keep this up before I divorce him? And I'm thinking, if we stay married for a year, well, I wanted to keep the gifts. <laughs> and come to think of it, I, I'm not even, you know what, my mom returned all the gifts for me. You know, well, well, I mean, I wasn't gonna do it. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I say all that to say, I had to call my mother and father up after being with him for five months and say, look, I'm getting a divorce. And before I gave them a chance to say anything, I said, and if you're with me, you're with me. If you're not, you'll be sorry. Because we don't come from a divorced family. You know, we come from a family where you just fight it out, hug it out, and tolerate each other or, or something. You know, like, nobody's, or, or you, you become a widow or a widower. <laughs> I mean, the older generation of my family, people just didn't divorce. And so, you know, I was, I was ready to box my parents. <laughs> I was. I was, and you wanna know what? They supported me 100%, so I bailed, but I was the one with the plot. So I waited for him to go to work. <laughs> well. <laughs> and I had already called like one of those big official moving companies, not like my brother and a van. You see what I'm saying? 
bought, I already had like for like two weeks, the reservation for the big giant moving company. I wanted to be sure that they came with affidavits saying that I didn't touch anything, you know, while it was being packed or broken. Affidavits down, everybody signed everything. I'm not touching anything. It, I was so official with this. <laughs> So then, um, and the apartment was in my name. Um, so then, um, I, we let, okay, so he comes home for work, from work at six o'clock at night. Now, by this time, everything was done, okay? I, I had already secured another apartment. Oh, yes. <laughs> and a storage unit for his stuff with insurance and all the proper papers saying that I didn't do anything but just tell the truck where to go. So he gets home from work and um, they, uh, excuse me, sir, um, you can't go upstairs. You no longer live here. <laughs> as a radio personality, as a celebrity in general, you know, people are always giving you gifts and you take them, you're like, hey. <laughs> so I get to work, it's like five o'clock, all right? And I walk in you know, through the front door, and there's, you know, this gentleman sitting there, and, you know, the receptionist, it's business as usual. And so he says, Wendy, I was waiting for you. He had a box from this store here in New York, this sporting goods store. Um, and so, you know, at that time, I loved wearing, you know, sneakers and whatnot. It was back when all the girls were wearing sneakers and Timberland boots and call heart, you know, <laughs> you know, call heart stuff, and we pull our ponytails. We were like B-girls to our B-boys, remember? Okay. So, you know, some new sneakers. So I take the box and the box feels heavy. You know, I wear a size 11 slash 12, so my, <laughs> my feet are heavy. And so I take it in, put it down, put my first, you know, record on and open up, you know, my new sneakers. There, well, there was a half a brick in there <laughs> and some divorce papers. <laughs> I'm just saying, so you have to watch how you, watch these process servers now. I remember season one of this show, Star Jones, who's still friend of the show, came here and I asked her about being served, because I was like, I told her how I was served, and we were talking about something having to do with somebody being served. I said, well, if you don't touch the papers, then you haven't been served, right, Star? And so Star said, nope, all you have to do is ignore, you've been served, even if the process, even if you go like this with your hands, if he drops them on the ground, you're still served. So just don't stare people in the eyes, and when people call your name, don't stop, because they might have papers for you and you'll be served. My husband doesn't wear a ring. Okay, when we first got married, he had a ring. Okay. So, so I get him the ring. We're married, we're happy. We're driving along the Garden State Parkway. Okay, this is before Easy Pass or before we got down, we, 17 years, so, okay. So this is like one year in, maybe six months in, whatever. Driving along the Garden State Parkway. He takes out his coins and throws, back then I think it was 35 cents to pass. You see where I'm going? Yeah. Okay. He takes out his coins to throw it in that hole <laughs> and the ring goes down the hole. Okay. Then, anyway, <laughs> the, the point is, is that he doesn't wear a ring, I wear a ring. Even if something were to happen, I'd still be wearing my ring because it's gorgeous. Yeah. If there is a regret that I have, I, you know, I wish that when Kevin and I got married 17 years ago, that I did take his last name, but I did not know where this relationship was, because I believe in divorce, even walking down the aisle. <laughs> we didn't walk down an aisle, we went to the Justice of the Peace in Jersey City, we were married by Grace Jones' brother. <laughs> hold, no, wait, no, wait, no. Hold another pull up to the bumper story. But look, so, you know, but even, even marrying him, I wasn't sure, uh, you know, that, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. And I was already, er, already established as WW here in New York and with a really flourishing radio career. And I said, well, if I change to Wendy Hunter and then we get divorced and I have to go back to Williams, I, it just, it's just all too much. But you know what? I wish I was a hunter. I wish I could change now. Unfortunately, now you guys know Wendy Williams. So I just want to drop the Williams and just be Wendy. Yeah. I just It's Hunter in real life, but I mean, for the purpose of being on the TV, really, Brendan, is that funny? <laughs> Excuse me, your wife is standing out here with her uh, surname from birth. We talked about this already, don't start. Oh. Let's move along. No, you heard him laughing, Suzanne. Yes, I did. Uh -huh. He's a loud laugher. Mm -hmm. <laughs>